Welcome back to Echo Ridge, and I have an important question for you. Has anyone seen any nosh beans laying around? As I'm looking at the achievements we still have yet to accomplish, I'm starting to concentrate a little bit more on GMO AOK. -okay. Because, well, I need to make sure I collect all the seeds to be able to mutate them. I have some pinch of pepper plants up here growing in plenty of radiation, so I know it's just a matter of time before one of those mutates. I hadn't put them up before because the temperature up here wasn't quite right. Well, now we're sitting at around 52 degrees, which is perfect for the pinch of pepper plant that likes it between 35 and 85. How was I able to do this? Well, I'm getting a little cheeky with the temperature control. This is the thermal aqua tuner, responsible for keeping these six steam turbines all nice and chill. Well, by just adjusting what I have the ambient temperature set at, it also adjusts the temperature of this room here. Whenever I have another plant that I need to put down, I can literally just adjust the temperature and as long as it's under 100 degrees for the steam turbines to still work and above the freezing point of the salt water that we've been using as the coolant, which reminds me I really should update that to super coolant, I can pretty much set this room at whatever temperature I need. I also have a couple of wheeze warts that I've been injecting a little bit of radiation into the sleet weeds for, I don't know, 400 cycles, hoping that one of those would mutate. More on that in a little bit. But the long and short of it is, I just need to get the seeds and then I can make the conditions for those things to grow and mutate. And that's when I realized we have a problem because I can't find any nos sprouts. For those of you not well versed in the wonderful world of the nosh bean plant, the nosh sprout is grown from the nosh bean. And it's one of those seeds that if you don't keep up with, will actually just rot and turn into polluted dirt. And that's pretty easy for them to happen because they require a temperature of minus 25 to zero. Anything out of that, they don't want to grow. I can already tell you that we don't have any nosh beans saved up in Tuxedo. Had I thought about this, I don't know, a thousand cycles ago, I would have ended up putting a nosh bean on a pedestal because anytime you put a food or a seed on a pedestal, it will not spoil and turn into polluted dirt. It's sort of a seed vault, if you will. We have Fergoni here, which I thought would have some conditions to have some nosh sprouts. One of the things we're picking up from here a little bit later is one of these dash of salt vines. And the wonderful Rubik's Cube sitting in Jackie's office. Yes, for those of you who did not know, this office point of interest is actually Jackie's office. You can see it on their certificate in applied physics. But so far from looking around on this planetoid, I don't see any nos sprouts. Another way you can always make sure and see if a planetoid has the conditions for those seeds is by clicking on the planetoid and checking out what kind of biomes it has. From here, you can quite literally click on the biome and it'll bring up the database entry. When you scroll down on the database entry, you can see the plants that will grow in it. And as you can see, inside the tundra, there is no nos sprouts. But in another one of the biomes on Fergoni, the rust biome, when we scroll down on its database entry, you can see that the nos sprout does grow there. Well, unfortunately, this is the rust biome here. So unless there's a nos sprout buried, I'm not feeling very good about this. There's also another rust biome down here where one hopefully is buried. I mean, the entire planetoid is cold enough. Which is what makes me so concerned about this is because normally you'd see a random wild gnaw sprout just growing. And so far, we don't. But a lot of this episode is going to be about getting over to the planetoids, picking things up, and bringing them back home to our home planetoid. Which brings us over to one of our favorites, Indrikazon. The ESS Larry landed here several cycles ago without much problem because, well, the rocket platform had plenty of height until its ceiling. And so far, we've picked up the double helix model and we put in an automatic dispenser here. The reason why we put an automatic dispenser is because I've set up, well, a couple of sweep commands. I want them to go get everything they can and bring it back to our home planetoid since we're already here so we don't have to ship it via interplanetary launcher. One of the things they'll be bringing back is waterweed seeds, which the waterweed is once again one of the plants that we need to mutate. Another one on that planetoid that we'd already shipped back was the Bog Bucket. We only have one C, but it's not too big of a deal because, well, we have a lot of radiation up here, so it's not going to take this Bog Bucket too long. Unfortunately, the temperature that the Bog Bucket wants to grow in is 10 to 30 degrees. So we have to wait until after we mutate the Pinch of Pepper plant. 
which to be honest, considering how many pinch of pepper seeds are here, I'm surprised we haven't mutated one yet. Because for those you didn't know, the more radiation you inject into the plant, the higher the chance that it will mutate. So basically the more radiation, the better. Now, two weaseworts aren't great, but they do provide enough radiation where I figured over time we'd get a sleet wheat to mutate. As a quick side note before I continue on that point, I did solve a mystery. Remember how I used to keep getting water that would spill right in here? And it would happen every so often and I have to go mop everything up and I could not figure out for the life of me where that water was coming from. Until I did one of these numbers, which I have to do every dozen or so cycles, because what's happening, since the Weezworts don't require the water that is being dropped off to their hydroponic farm, that water just gets colder and colder until finally it bursts in its little pipes. Well, then I have an auto sweeper that picks up the ice and sends it back down to our storage, except, as I'm sure you can guess already, it never really makes it there. Because this wall is sitting at 13 degrees and these little ice chunks are very, very small. So as the ice goes through, it literally just melts sitting on this tile and makes our mess. And due to the viscosity of water, well, the mess ends up all over the place because of the positioning and the sort of stairway effect that we have here. So how do you solve that problem? Well, you'd stop giving water to these wee sports, and that way the water wouldn't be sitting inside of these hydroponic tiles. But because the piping here is so ridiculous, I'm not going to be able to do that. So I'm just going to stop the ice from being picked up by the conveyor loader. Now the little ice chunks will just sit right in here after I dig them out every once in a while. And we'll keep doing that until we get enough radiation injected into these sleet weeds. Any day now, I'm sure. But with that being said, over here on the Temporal Terra planet of Chileos, there is already a sleet wheat grain that has mutated. All because of, yes, the radiation coming off of this Weezwort and a little bit coming from space. Like I said, over enough time and enough radiation, the game's eventually going to give you a mutated seed. Hence the reason I haven't been really in a hurry here, or down here in our gas grass either. So hopefully, eventually, we'll knock out a couple more plants just by doing what we're already doing. But GMO AOK -okay is not actually the achievements that we're going to knock out today. Today, we're going to knock out Cluster Conquest by landing a duplicate or a rover on two more planetoids and Cosmic Archaeology. Only thing we're waiting for in Cosmic Archaeology is another four terrestrial artifacts. We already know there's one terrestrial artifact sitting on the ESS Larry. That'll be coming home soon. There's one sitting over here on Fregoni, which we're going to need to come here anyways to pick up this wonderful dash of salt vine seed and start digging around for a NOS bean. That gets us to 8 out of 10. And then over here on Setamista, you can see that there's two pedestals with two artifacts sitting on them. That's sort of all we really need. So if I land a rocket here, I can jump in, grab the artifacts, and then just turn around and leave. Now this one won't count for landing a duper rover because, well, we've already landed a rover here. The last two places that we need to land a rover are in Chileos and Sokerlin, which is the water world. Lucky for us, our hydrogen supply is doing a little bit better. The ESS Mo is already ready to go. But if you remember from the last episode, there is one small problem with the ESS Mo, and that's the fact that there's 43 kilos worth of oxygen pressure in here. This is not a big deal. All we have to do to vent some of that pressure is, well, vent it to the vacuum of space. The ESS Curly will be spending their same time doing what they always do, and that's using the drill cone. Except now that I have plenty of these wonderful, interesting artifacts, it doesn't really make sense for me to go all over the star map, basically wasting fuel, when all I really need to do is plug away at Mine the Gap. So what we're looking for is a space POI that has mostly solids, that is pretty close to our home planetoid of Toxedo. These over here don't really work very well unless I want to start picking up gases and liquids, which we don't really need. But this one here is not too bad. It's an organic mass field only seven tiles away. So that means the round trip only takes 14 tiles and it has 90% solids. Granted, it's not solids we need, but then there's this swampy ore field that has dirt, mud, and cobalt ore, not too bad, only six tiles away. But then we have this rocky asteroid field with sedimentary rock, igneous rock, and copper ore. This is the money right here. 
it is also only seven tiles away. So I think what we'll do is we'll keep mining it until it doesn't have any mass remaining. Let it fill back up and then hit the forested ore field behind it, which has 70% igneous rock and 10% aluminum ore. And with a range of 32 tiles, I can make probably two and a half trips out to those asteroid fields and back without having to worry about refilling. Okay, bad things are happening. We were getting scalding messages and I wasn't sure why, but apparently the duplicants have gotten their hands on 975 degree igneous rock. There's only one place where I know that there's 975 degree igneous rock, and it is down here. What were you thinking, duplicants? Oh, no big deal. The igneous rock sitting inside the storage bin is 1270 degrees. What we're gonna do is drop all those on the ground, use our move to command, and then bring it inside the sauna and let it sit on these metal tiles to cool off quite a bit. And then for the short term, we're gonna build a bunch of dirt temperature shift plates here, which will absorb a lot of that temperature so everything will stop scalding and overheating here. And then to prevent this issue from happening in the future, I'll put a door here and make sure the duplicates aren't allowed in here unless I'm watching them. In the meantime, we've expanded the emergency services offered by our hospital and added a few more beds. Sorry about that, dupes. With that situation fixed and the temperature shift plates now back down to 46 degrees, nobody else is scalding. There's a few hot areas, but they're calming down a little bit. We can now focus back on our mission at hand. Step one, let's get the ESS Curly back out to space. The ESS Mo has about 30 kilos worth of oxygen pressure, so it's going to take a few more minutes before I want to let dupes back in here. I also need to get some food, though. I'm going to deconstruct this storage bin and put another refrigerator up there. And that way, all I have to do is manually check and see how much oxalite is in the cabin. And the duplicates will load up food automatically when they return. Now, for this trip that we're heading out on now, we're not going to bring four duplicates. Probably just two. One for the Trailblazer module and one to be the pilot. With the ESS Curly gone, I wanted to mention something that I'm not sure everybody's thought about before. Just because you have a rocket assigned to a rocket platform doesn't mean you can't sort of hot bunk with the rocket platforms. In other words, nothing prevents us from just adding a new rocket right now. The idea being that by the time the ESS Curly makes it all the way out here and back, we could then launch that other rocket so the Curly would have some place to land. I don't think it's 100% necessary, but it is definitely possible especially considering we seem to be doing pretty good on the liquid hydrogen and the liquid oxygen front. The oxygen pressure inside the ESS Mo is finally down to about two and a half kilos, so we can stop emergency dumping oxygen to the vacuum of space. For our crew, I've selected Whiskey as the pilot and the never failing Carol as the dupe that'll land first on the planetoids. Step one will be the very short trip over to Fergoni that we haven't been to in probably, I don't know, 1500 cycles? With that rocket heading off, for the first time in probably 50 or 60 cycles, we don't have a single rocket here on the planetoid. Which is great because it'll allow the hydrogen fuel to build back up even though we're doing pretty good. As you can see, we have plenty sitting inside the tank and we even have about two tons worth inside the buffer tank. Now I remember landing here and evidence shows that we do have a rover sitting here, but it took me a second to find the steel debris. That way I know where to land Carol so they can get this steel to be able to build the rocket platform. The question is though, how tall is it from here up? Oh, it looks like it has plenty of distance. Now I'm gonna try something, but I'm gonna go ahead and save first. A couple of folks in the comments said, probably about a year ago, you no longer have to put the duplicate manually in the suit. Here is a suit sitting right here. The question is, if I dock this suit, that way making sure that there's two suits available, and then I just put Carol inside the Trailblazer module, I'm being told that the game automatically puts them in the suit if there is one connected to the door. Well, we're about to find out. Now, there's not a lot of great options because you have to land this thing on the ground it can't interfere with the satellite, nor would we want to, because that's a whole lot of radiation. I suppose I could land right here and then dig over. Yeah, I think that's what we're going to have to do. Carol's a good digger, so we're going to see how this works. Here comes Carol. The question is, are they in their suit? They are in their suit. Thanks once again to the wonderful suggestions by the comments. No, no, Carol, we got a time. No, what are we, what are we doing? Why are we resting right now? Let's dig. 
You think this situation's gonna get better after a nap? Ugh, oh, I should have waited till they woke up from their sleeps. All right, here's what we're gonna do. I'm at least gonna toggle red alert so they can get out of the sunlight to take their little nap. Otherwise, they're gonna keep waking up because it's too bright. Ah, oh, looks like we skipped right through the sleep that night for Carol. No big deal. Build a couple of ladders right here. Like the pro Carol is, the rocket platform is done. So we can get started on that. I'm even gonna get started on the ladders because we've learned that Carol doesn't care about rocket exhaust. Now I'm gonna put our radiation protection in place, but normally I'd end up putting a wheel in here, but we're really not gonna be here too long, correct? Oh, never mind. we're already out of power. Step one down here, we're gonna grab this dash of salt vine seed. This isn't one we have to worry about going off. So we're just gonna put it inside the rocket. We're also gonna dig into Dr. Stern's office and grab the Rubik's Cube. And then we're gonna go digging through all these little buried objects here, hoping for a nosh sprout. We have found a nosh bean. I don't know if it's been sitting here this whole time or if it happened in one of our digs, but we have found one. So we don't need to stay any longer than that. So now all we really need to do is get into Dr. Stern's office. But I need to protect this nosh bean. It's deep frozen right now, but it won't be for our voyage home. So we're gonna deconstruct one of these ladder beds and put down a wonderful pedestal. And then after scrolling for a bit too long, we just select one of the nosh beans and now it'll be delivered to this pedestal and we won't have to worry about it spoiling before we get home because we're not heading back to Tuxedo first. We're heading all the way over to Sokerlin and then we'll head back to Tuxedo. Well, maybe not because I forgot reed fiber again. We're only a half a cycle home. It'd be great to repair some Atmos suits. We'll go ahead and crew Carol and Whiskey up. Now all these ladders are made out of igneous rock, so I'm pretty sure some of them are gonna get damaged. This iron ore manual generator is gonna get damaged, so we're just gonna be adding to the whole damaged building messages in the top left for the rest of the game. Sorry, not sorry. I also realized that I did have to go home anyways because I need to resupply the Trailblazer module. Yeah, we have a rover left, but we don't have any more modules. It'd be kind of cool if you could load up multiple modules inside of it. Maybe a selector that says, hey, how many modules do you want to load up? Same thing with the rover. It'd be kind of cool to load up four or five rovers. I'm glad I thought about that before we made it all the way out to Sokerlin. Well, goodbye to Fergoni for the last time. Really hoping there's nothing on this planetoid that we forgot. And there's the wonderful overheating message. Well, that didn't take very long at all. Now it's gonna be a little while before we can actually plant this nosh bean because again, it likes it pretty cold. So we're gonna transfer it to yet another pedestal. I suppose it is actually cold enough in this area where I could start growing it naturally. I mean, there's not a lot of radiation there, but at least it'd give me more nosh beans so that by the time we were ready to irradiate it, it'd work. Let's try it with a couple of wheeze warts, shall we? As I was messing around with the nosh bean, we got a seed analysis complete, which means we are done with the pitcher pepper plant. This time we got a super specialized, which for those of you who didn't know, yields twice as much pitcher pepper months, but the viable temperature range is reduced by 80%. More importantly, we can also get rid of these pitcher pepper plants up here and start saving up our polluted water for the bog buckets we're about to plant, which means I need to adjust this temperature back down, we'll say 20 degrees. Something I've noticed that the game does recognize that we have a nosh bean, but it will not let me plant it. And I'm assuming it's because it's sitting inside the rocket right now. So I'm gonna move it first. Also gonna plant a couple of wheeze warts right here next to the nosh bean. Now, one thing the nosh bean is gonna take, and that is gonna be ethanol. We do have our ethanol distillery, so I'm not too worried about it. But what I'm gonna do is end up filling this liquid reservoir, not using this petroleum generator in the meantime, and just preventing the ethanol from being used. That way I can deconstruct the liquid reservoir and then we'll have five tons worth of ethanol. And as expected, now that the seed is on the outside of the rocket, I'm able to plant it. Now, remember, the brack wax cleaner does produce the carbon dioxide, so there's enough carbon dioxide in here for the nos sprout. And because it's right next to our sleet wheats, it's plenty cold enough as well. One disadvantage of the nos sprout is they take 21 cycles in order to grow. So I'm gonna be a little cheeky and throw in another farm station right next to this one. And that way it'll grow in half the amount of time. So about 10 and a half cycles, which will save us a lot in ethanol. I think everything's settled here with the ESS Mo. We have our rad pills, we have our food. 
We have the Trailblazer lander already. We have Rover's lander. And we have two full tanks of fuel. It's not bad for a quick pit stop. Meanwhile, on Rikazan, we've got Angry Forest all loaded and ready. We have our double helix model and a lot of additional supplies that we're bringing home. They'll be able to pass each other on the star map. I just realized too that I'm able to pack in a lot of radiation right on this Nos sprout because I have it flanked by the Weez Warts. Whereas over here, I had them off to the side so they weren't quite getting as much radiation. I'm gonna move some plants around and then even duplicate our efforts over here at the gas grass. But because I don't want any of that liquid chlorine to start flashing, I'm gonna let this gas grass drink the rest of it that's sitting in there and we disconnected it. That way we don't even have to worry about it. And I'll put another Weez board in here. Now we do have three gassy moves in here. They're gonna have to fight for some of the gas grass, but that's not too big of a deal. It's not too small of a amount that we're, they're gonna end up starving. They just may not be as happy as they normally are. Speaking of which, we're up to 1,100 kilos worth of brack wax. We don't have a lot to do with it, but we've got it. With the ESS Larry back from Rikazon, we're actually gonna get rid of one of these large liquid fuel tanks on the exploration rocket and change it out for a rover's module. But when we swapped out the fuel tank, it gave us all that liquid hydrogen back. Needless to say, I'm not letting 900 kilos worth of hydrogen go to waste. So we're gonna open this place back up. We're gonna move the bottle in there and then empty it. Oh, that is nutcakes. We just finished analyzing a sleet wheat. In fact, multiple of the sleet wheat grains ended up mutating. That is such great news. We can get rid of these Weez warts immediately. It only took these Weez warts being in there for one round. If it ends up working over here with this Nos sprout after its first harvest, or for this gas grass, which I guess makes sense, and I'm a little hopeful for these two plants now because we're literally doubling the amount of radiation by putting two Weez warts there instead of one. All right, we made a boo-boo. We're not supposed to be going to Sokerlin. We're supposed to be going to Setamista because it's where the two artifacts are. But there is already a rover's lander here, so I still think I can knock out both planetoids in one trip. Sokerlin is here, Setamista is here. The ESS Mo has 25 tiles remaining, and after some quick math, it looks like we will have enough range to hit Sokerlin, swing by Setamista, and then head all the way back to Tuxedo. Fingers crossed. I'm sure it'll go great. One issue, though, is I kind of needed that rover's lander way over here. And then that'll leave the ESS Larry to drop off a rover here on Chileos, which we're going to have a couple of episodes coming up soon about Chileos, because this is where the Temporal Terra opener is. And I just realized I had that rocket launch and the insulated tiles weren't back into place yet. That's going to set us back a little bit. And oh my goodness, we had used gold for the heavy watt conductive wire and the rocket had no problem just shredding through it. Let me put some steel in, just in case. Which I figured it'd be fun to give you some quick updates on that. We're up to about 40 tons of steel and over 30 tons of thermium now. We're also still cooking along with 39.5 tons of enriched uranium, so this reactor can quite literally run forever. Because we got ourselves such a surplus that now the uranium ore that does fall on the planetoid happens to be enough to run one research reactor even when you're putting that uranium ore through the centrifuge. The ESS Mo is in orbit of Sokerlin, which we are just dropping off a rover here, no big deal. And while we can see quite a bit just from rover landing, we want to see a little bit more. So we're going to make sure that happens. We're going to dig out this tile here, then we're going to dig out this tile here, and then rover is going to become an aquatic robot. Whee! Now, despite how heavy you'd think rover is, they don't sink very fast. Oh, there's a nice cool slush geyser. That's fun. We have a water geyser here, some oxalite here, and we're still falling. Anybody need any water? A bunch of sandstone. And then down here somewhere should be the point of interest location. Yes, here it is. There's also two office mugs down here, but those are not the ones that we want. There's also a lot of graphite and fresh lime. Look at all these glorious tiles filled with lime. Lime, remember, is one of the key ingredients to steel that normally we get very little bit at a time by smashing up eggshells. And graphite's one of the few ways you can make fullerene by combining it with sulfur and aluminum. I still prefer getting my fullerene from the gilded asteroid fields, which will give you 10%. 
But I like the fact that the devs give you multiple ways to get some of these resources. And the ESS Larry is now orbiting Chileos. Oh no, where's my rover? Well, apparently they did not deliver a rover. So the ESS Larry has to go all the way back home and pick up a rover. Yeah, I should have double checked, but come on. How long does it take for a duplicate to drop off a rover inside the rover module? With the ESS Mo nearly in orbit, I wanted to highlight this radioactive asteroid field that has 18% uranium ore. So even in the case that you're not on a planetoid that has uranium, there are still renewable points of interest around the map that you can send cargo runs to quite often. Now this is not a very big asteroid field. You can see the total mass remaining is 9.5 tons, especially when you compare it to like the rocky asteroid that has 57 tons or even the forested ore field with 59 tons. It's still a nice little resource. All right, the plan. I need Carol to land down here, be able to deconstruct the rover's lander, and that way we can put the rocket platform in. Then all we have to do is dig over and up, which is more of a pain than you'd think because whenever you're digging this regolith, it's gonna keep wanting to fall down on itself. Mo is in orbit, so we can throw Carol in the Trailblazer module once again. And I think this is a good enough spot right here. What's making this all the better is the fact that we're doing this all in a meteor shower. Not too big of a deal because Carol is an absolute pro. We're gonna land the rocket. Now, there's not a lot of materials here that we can use to build ladders. So I think we're gonna try to go over here and grab some of this obsidian and granite. It might have been a better call just to go get this mafic rock over here because we have to dig through all of this regolith before we can actually get to the granite. I have lowered the spacefarer module, but we're still not doing great on time, especially considering once again, Carol wants to take a nap. We finally have some materials to build more ladders out of and up we go nice and easy. I'm doing the every other ladder thing right now because I need to get Carol inside so they can eat and use the bathroom. With that done, all we have to do is get all the way over here, grab the artifacts and leave. Very simple, shouldn't be too bad, right? Really? Another meteor shower already? Come on. And we've made it in. We have a cell phone and a stethoscope. We could do the neural vacillator, but quite frankly, it's getting pretty ugly outside and we just need to go home before our rocket gets broken. We have our two artifacts loaded. Let's get home. Good thing our home planetoid's only 11 tiles away. Goodbye to the dumpster fire of all dumpster fires. Look at this beautiful unknown mutation. Our now sprout came in. We have already have one analyzed and it is a lysy now sprout. Mental note, when you're trying to mutate plants, highly recommend using two Weezworts. And sure enough, with the ESS Larry back, the rover's module did not have a rover in it. Why? because they can't reach it. It was a new rover's module and I had never really put the ladder there for them to be able to build the rover module inside of it. Oops. The ESS Mo is getting close thanks to that mission control speed boost. They'll be back this cycle, which by the way, we just crossed the 2000 cycle mark. And then finally the ESS Larry is about two and a half cycles over from Chileos. So I fully expect to have two achievements finished in just a few minutes. Well, isn't that wonderful? I barely just got these bog buckets to grow and we've already have an easy going bog bucket. The next plant going is the dash of salt vine. I'm just going to put a couple of salt vines here and drop off bleach stone. Yep, we're mailing it in this time. Speaking of achievements, the ESS Larry is about to drop off a rover and I suspect as soon as it lands, the achievement will trigger. There it goes. Cluster conquest. Duplicants of rovers landed on 11 of 11 planetoids. I'm really excited about this one because Majin Lord is finishing analyzing the strange brick and it'll be the first time that I've personally achieved cosmic archaeology. So here's another big old spoiler warning because I'm going to play whatever little video or message that they have when we unlock cosmic archaeology. Imperative achieved cosmic archaeology. All right, looks like we're doing the same old planetary look around. Oh, I see what it was doing. It was showing different artifacts.
And it finishes it off with a little message. Very nice. Now we only have The Great Escape and four ridiculously difficult achievements. We're getting there, though. As I said, these episodes are taking longer and longer to produce. I mean, what is it, cycle 2006? I think I started preparing for this episode in the early 1900s. So let me know what you thought of the episode down in the comments below. And remember, another way you can support the video and this series is by liking the video, which lets YouTube know that, hey, this one's pretty good. Keep recommending it to people. Until next time, much love, happy gaming, and I'll talk to you soon.